we're just going to go ahead and, uh, I really don't think my message is going to be long. I know the people that know me are laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm really going to talk. I've, I've been asking the Lord, Lord, please help me. I got so much in here, you know, just let a lot to come out at one time. You know? All right. So we're going to read, though. I believe in the public reading of Scripture. We're going to read a story out of 2 Kings chapter 5. I chose to read to you out of the ESV version. i got to be honest with you. My favorite translation of the Bible is the old King James. Um, that's that's the one I love. I only really will ever read probably from you is from a literal translation. Um, I'll never read to you. I, I'll never own a message Bible. I didn't mean to offend you if you own one, but I'll never own one. It's not even a Bible. You know, we don't have time to talk about all that right now. But if you ever want to talk to me, please get get my phone number. In this okay. But with that said, this morning we're reading out of the ESV. And it is a literal translation. And we're going to read a story about a man named Naaman. And he was a leper. Alright, here we go. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master. And in high favor. Because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. And she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. In other words, she was a servant in her house. She had said to her mistress, would, and the NASB, I believe, says, wish that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. The prophet's name, by the way, was Elisha. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord, which was the king of Syria, thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant. Naaman was the king's general, just so that we understand properly. My servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. Now listen, I, I didn't even put this in my message in the DP again until I just read it right there. But I gotta tell you something. How many times does the devil put a bunch of lies on the inside of your head? Come on, Come on somebody. Y'all see how No. If you ain't been serving the Lord for very long, then you really need me to tell you this. And if you've been serving the Lord for a long time, and every time you walk out of the house of God, all kind of lies bombard your head. You need to learn the difference between the voice of God and the voice of the devil. This king over here freaking out thinking they're setting me up to die and no, that's not even what's happening. God is moving and operating through his people to set up an opportunity for a miracle. And listen to me, church. Listen to me, child of God. God wants to set up opportunities to do a miracle in your heart. Amen. But the enemy will always tell lies to try to move us out of the right place where God is right. That's just, That was flying out right there. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he said to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Amen. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went away 
in a ray. Isn't that amazing? We never want to do it the way God wants to do it. That's, that's another that's message that's for another time. All right, yeah. let's just keep going. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Right? Let's open this word. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. You know, there's another word in here that I want to think. Look, the prophet tried to tell Naaman. This is all extra stuff right here. The prophet tried to tell Naaman, go dip. What happens? Naaman gets offended. The word of the Lord came to him. Naaman gets offended from the man of God speaking truth. But guess what? Then some of his partners on the side or his servants on the side that know him say, what are you doing, great master? Did he not tell you to go wash? Won't you be here? Won't you be there? And then what does he do? Then he relents and he goes and he dips right, right, and, he, and right. he does it. What is the point to that? The point is you got friends with people that you might invite to church one day. And you're inviting them expecting that they're going to receive a great blessing. And then I get up here and what I believe to do is to speak forth the truth of the word undiluted unapologetically because that's what God told me to do. And whenever I do it, they might get offended. Good news, good news. You know better than I do. Good news, you got their ear then when I might not. One day I might have their ear, but on that day I didn't. But you now get to walk in your anointing. You now get to do what God's called you to do, which is to augment or to explain in more detail or to help and to pray with your brother or sister so that now we're working as a body together. Amen. You can't disconnect the pinky or take an eyeball out and expect the body to function right, properly. Right. No, we all have a purpose. Amen. Amen. This, this, is, this ain't got nothing to do with the message, but I got to tell you something right here. Listen. I tell these people, look, I'm also a nurse practitioner for those that you are visiting. And I do a lot of other things when the Lord opens the doors and I can do it. And I always want to be the best at what I can do. And I'll admit to you that sometimes I probably do have too many arms and four far, but I'm usually pretty productive, at least a little bit of what I'm doing. <laughs> Nevertheless, this is the when I'm at the hospital and the door opens, I will say to them, because, you see, this is how I look at it. The world is talking about their sexual exploitation. See, this is a PG-13 church at least, all right? The world is at the water cooler talking about their sexual exploitations. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm only 17. I don't know what exploitation means. Talking about their sexual encounters. Talking about their lustful desires. And they talk about it very openly and in public. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't act all holy over there. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And they talk about, man, dude, we tore one on the other night, bro. We like, were sucking suds and we were smoking dope. Is it okay if I just talk like a real person? Oh. All right. And they're out there and they're talking about that. But then whenever the... The per what if the preacher supposed to just stay behind the pulpit? Can't have a secular job too. He can't take his Jesus with him in public. Right. No, I'm bringing my Jesus with me. I told the girl when she hired me, I said, "If you hire me, you get Jesus." Amen. Right. Amen. It's a package deal, my friend. Yeah, I'm not leaving him in the closet. Now listen, there was a time in my walk that I tried to leave him in the closet. So don't think that I just showed up one day like this. No, the Lord had to do a work in me. Right. Right. Okay. But what I'm trying to say is, I am convinced. My whole purpose in this little rabbit trail. Just to let you know, I've learned something, and I tell them this at work all the time. My purpose, and listen, dude, I work so hard over there, they tripping. Like, I'm bringing the lab. I'm doing the tech work, the nurse work, the nurse practitioner work. I learned something from Sean a long time ago. I even clean my own table now, Sean. <laughs> huh? Come on, brother. You be proud of me. Why? Because as a team player, I need to make the whole thing work. Teamwork makes the dream work. They're not going to blame me for being lazy. Because if I'm going to talk about Jesus out loud and publicly, they're not going to say, oh, he's talking about Jesus, but look at him. He don't do nothing to scroll on Facebook. And look at that. No, no, no. You might scroll on Facebook, my friend, but this dude right here, I'm going to get it from for 12 hours. Now, if there ain't no patience to see, then guess what? I'm about to break up my iPad and start reading the Word of God. Because, because I can do that more so in the point is, what is my point? My point, I don't know what my you point is. I don't know what my point is. Brought Jesus. Brought Jesus. And I learned that my purpose on earth is not to be the best nurse practitioner, although I want to be that. Not to be the best root salesman, but if the Lord opens the door and there's more room to sell, I want to be the best at it. Not to be the best pastor, I want to be a good one. Not to be the best husband, I need help in that area. Not to be the best father, I need help in that area. But to live for Jesus! 
to be a representative of him on this earth. Look, you want to be the real one as well. And if it's real, this is my purpose. This is your purpose. Amen. You might not know it yet. Not, you're not called to be the best musician in the Amen. world. You're not even called to be a multimillionaire. Oh, he might let you be one Amen. one day. But if you ain't worshiping the Lord, and if you're not fulfilling your purpose when your pockets are full of all your money, then you ain't even received nothing. That's right. That's you're just another little worldly falling apart yeah. at the seams. No, 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 no. Your purpose on earth in this little vapor, James calls it a vapor, vapor yeah. called life. Is to live for Jesus. And then, as me and Dale were praying when he walked up here, then you and I may hear those words that we long to hear. Yes, well Lord. done, my good and faithful son. Yes, nice. huh? Amen. Amen. He went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh mm. of a little child. And he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and he stood before him. And he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Look at this. So accept now a present from your servant. None of this is trying to be spoken of, but do you see the heart of this, brother? Yeah. He just got healed. The Lord just touched him. You know, I used to be parts of churches in the past, and it wasn't the last one. So those of you that know me from the last church, it's not that one. It's the one before. Where there's a certain sect in Christianity. Where everybody thinks that they just deserve this blessing. I'm a king's kid. I'm a child of God. God wants to bless you, my friend. Yeah. But one time as I was praying, after the Lord got a hold of me, of course, and my selfish prayers were turning into more like, kind of starting to turn into selfless ones. And I was like, Lord, I need you to do this in my heart and in my life. You know what the Lord said? But guess what I need? I need you to do something with me. When you going to quit asking for a blessing and start being a Come on. Oh, look at this. He got his life changed. And he says, now will you accept this present from your servant? Don't walk around. Listen, do me a favor. You ain't got to go around telling everybody where you go to church because they think I'm weird and they won't think you weird. Okay? <laughs> but look, if you do tell them you go to our church, try to be aware. Or no, don't, don't even worry about the church. If you tell people Jesus, that's really the problem. That's the situation. If you tell people you love Jesus, be aware of the way you talk. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and, listen, the Lord's co corrected me on this before. I'm talking to you about things that the Lord's dealt with me about. When, when the Lord said, you know, you don't represent me that well. Kind of like, you know, you can't put Levi on a brand of jeans that they just rattle. You, because Levi built their name on the copper ribbon. Back in the China, when the Chinese were building the railroad, you can't put the name Levi on there if it don't hold up to the brand. You and I can't go talking about Jesus if we like talk like the world, act like the world, do all the stuff of the world. And guess what? You can't expect to take advantage of people and talk about Jesus. And guess what? People deserve a a, a, a man is is worthy of his hire. If if you hire someone to do something, pay him people. Now, they might be like Naaman or like Elisha and say that he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive none. Ha! Amen. And then you got your blessing, but you got to hear from the Lord. Amen. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, there's more to the story, but we're not going to get into that. Because somebody comes behind, the false pre preacher. Dude, this story is so good. The false preacher leaves Elisha and tries to find Naaman on the road and says, hey, he, he, you know, he really wanted me to come back and get some money. And that, that's just like the money brother preachers on TV, man. Oh, sow your seed and receive your harvest. Look, man, you can give it to the house of the Lord and the Lord will bless you. Amen. But Amen. but don't listen to no lying preacher on TV. It's the right, Lord. Right. You're supposed to give it to the house of God. We're supposed to give to the kingdom of God. We're yeah. supposed to give. give. God gave everything. Yeah. You, need to, you know what you need to do? This is my recommendation. You find yourself a preacher or a church where they're telling the truth. And, and that you can get behind and you support it with your time. You support it with your money. Amen. You, su Amen. you support it. Amen. Because it's the work of God. And we're going we're gonna to bring the gospel forward. And we're going to minister to people. Amen? Amen. Amen. But don't be giving money to the lying preachers, man. <laughs> it's a waste of time. But the Lord will bless you anyway if your heart's right. That's Amen. Amen. But if you're going to, I'm about to put, I'm about to sow my $1,000 seed because the man of God. <laughs> 
one bad thing you will like about me if you're visiting is that I do call out names sometimes. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you, I'm not making you people say, touch not mine anointed. That ain't even what the world's talking about, man. That man ain't anointed if he ain't, if he ain't, if he ain't led right. by the Holy Ghost. Amen. I was going to say one time, uh, my friend John made up a name. I'm going to tell him, like, create a flow dollar. <laughs> Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> he said, create a flow dollar, but I'm so good. But that's what a lot of them guys are doing. They're like, sow your thousand dollar seed and you're going to receive your ten thousand dollar reward. Man, dude, if that's your motive, you, we're so way off yeah, on y'all. Yeah. Okay, all right, let's keep going because we got to go. <laughs> Said, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. What? For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any god but the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master, the king, goes into the house of Remen, the god of Syria, to worship there, leaning on my arm. Now, I got to tell you, I don't know this for sure. The Bible doesn't tell us specifically. <laughs> but what I'm gathering from this is that the king is maybe old and needs help. And Naaman is his great general. And that whenever the king goes into that false god's temple to worship, he holds on to Naaman. And then he says, leaning on my arm and I bow myself. So I, this is what I'm imagining and I can't prove it to you but this is what I see. The king kneels down to worship Remen and Naaman has to kneel down with him because when this older king goes to get up, Naaman's got to help him get up. So he's saying when I go in there with my master and his arm is on me and I bow myself in the house of Remen when I bow myself, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said go to him, go in peace. Okay, and then, and then now we're going into the message. There we go. You ready? <laughs> This is, the, this is the, the title of my message. Two loads of dirt. Mm -hmm. Amen. We see this story, and this story takes place in 2 Kings. It's an Old Testament passage that's probably taking place. I didn't look up the time frame. You can, don't hold me to it. 850 BC, give or take a half a century either. All right? And, and so this is about 850 years before Jesus is ever born. This is in the time frame of the kings. Of Israel. The kings had been disobedient to God. Just like God's people today oftentimes are disobedient. God would send the prophets to tell them to repent and, and to get their hearts and their lives right. And now at this time we have the prophet Elisha who comes off the ministry of Elijah. And these two great prophets had been ministering to the people of God in the midst of a time of rebellion. Okay, and, and Syria is actually one of the enemies of Israel, and we can look at a map today, and we can see Syria kind of sits right on top geographically of where the northern part of Israel takes place. And we, we see in this story this leper. I, I talked to you a little bit about leprosy because, you know, back when Sean and I were in nursing school, well, maybe they, there was a place called uh, what, uh, Carville. Right? Yeah. Carville. It was, a, it was, it was a, a, a leper colony in Louisiana. Mm. And, and, and it, wow. it, it was also called Hansen's disease. Wow. Well, I don't even think it's there anymore because, you know, we found out that leprosy was actually caused by bacteria. Right. And modern medicine was able to make medicines. And now you don't really see much of lepers anymore. But they didn't have the technology to treat it. Right. And right. scripturally, leprosy is a type of sin. You see, the leper's skin, the bacteria, would begin to eat away at it. And externally, just like sin does internally, it would begin to slowly erode the exterior of the individual to the point where they would be like an unsightly mess. Sores and digits missing and weeping skin. And, and they would have to dress them. Now, there were certain levels of leprosy in some and maybe not quite as bad. We don't know how bad names was. But, but lepers, now they, sometimes their families and their friends would still be close to them and spend time with them. But for the most part, when they were out in public, they had to notify, at least in the time frame of Jesus, they'd have to walk across the street. And I've told y'all this before. And they would have to cry out in public and say, unclean, unclean. They'd have to let the world around them know they were unclean. Mm. Now, 
I'm just trying to say, like, some of you people have been embarrassed in public. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? I've been embarrassed before. I've, people made fun of me when I was a kid before in front of a crowd of people, and it just feels so weird. Could you imagine living your life that way? Some of you have never been depressed before because of the way people have treated you. Come on, Pastor. And because of the things that you've gone through mm -hmm. and the weights of life and the trials and circumstances of life. And you've been left to feel very uncomfortable in social situations and circumstances. Yeah. I can't even imagine being in maiden shoes. You know what I'm saying? Like to live. It says he was a mighty man of power, but he was a leper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's saying a lot, my friend. But he was a leper. You know, and even people that love God, they were a mighty man of God, but they had a little spot of leprosy. And many times that leprosy will reveal itself when they're in our actions. You know, back in the day, there was a time in my Christianity, and I thank God it's not necessarily like that anymore. And it's only God's grace when I would like sneak in the backyard and I would drink a 40 ounce quart of beer. I would do whatever, but I was in bondage to it, man. I, I mean, I was bound by pornography as a Christian, and, and some people were like, yeah, you know, no, it wasn't nothing good about it. I was in I was in a prison. Right, right. You see what I'm saying? And I see Naaman, like, kind of like his life. He was a mighty man of valor, but he had this thing that he couldn't shake right, that right. was affecting his mind and everywhere that he went. And listen to me, friends, sin is just like that. It's not. It, it is. And it can, so, but I got, oh, this story gets good. All right? And in the midst of all of this, a little girl gets caught up in a skirmish. And then there's a, kind of like a baptism. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But then these two loads of dirt. All right? So let's start off with this. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. Now, I don't know about you, but I was just thinking about this little girl. I said, I want to try to keep this message pretty simple this morning. And I just, I'm going to focus on this little girl, and I'm going to focus on naming a little bit later. And I thought about this little girl, and so many things jump off the screen to me. And you know, like, number one, how old was she when she was taken up in this skirmish? I mean, you understand what happened. There was a battle between Syria and Israel, and a little Israelite girl was taken captive from her home, maybe even ripped out of the arms of her mother. I don't know. And she was taken away, and now she's a servant in the house of Naaman, the mighty man of valor, who is a leper. And there she lives. She wasn't so young that she was a toddler in an ancient bassinet because she remembers. She remembers there was a prophet in Samaria. And I can tell you in the context, Elisha had the double anointing. Elisha did more miracles than Elijah. She knows what prophet she's talking about. So I don't know how old she is. I don't know how long she's been in Naaman's house. But when she was taken, she was old enough to know her parents. She was old enough to know the prophet. She was old enough to know her nation. She was old enough to know the God that she was raised to serve. And here she has been taken captive, my friend, ripped from her normal way of life, taken captive. I mean, can you even wrap your mind around that? Like, I mean, think about it. Okay, you can't wrap your mind around that because you've never been taken captive. All right, well, think about the worst trial you've ever experienced. It may be worse than that, but probably not. This girl was captive. All right? But what did she say? Look at her. I wish my master, who is in Samaria, could be there because then he would be cured of his leprosy. She's not, right now I'm about to get into some other stuff, but she's not so focused on her own situation that she doesn't still speak the truth. I, I wonder, when we think of leprosy, yeah, I was talking about people's facial expressions, or I tried to anyway earlier, because during the week I had some encounters with some people and I started to notice, I think the Lord wanted me to see it. The look of consternation on people's face. Some people at work that I work with, nurses, and the heavy burden that I can see on their face. Right. Uh, and even the guy that I want to go do the building deal with in Iowa, Louisiana, or whatever. And the, the, how one guy's so busy, so rude, that after I've written a check for $3,600, I thank God I would never treat, I never would treat one of your customers that way, lady. They always get time. People get time. 
I don't care how busy you are, people should get time, especially if they're going to pay you money. But anyway, I was basically kicked out of that room and shuffled to a room with an underling. Thank God. Because the underling just gave me what I needed. Amen. But it's still, I can see in his face the busyness. He had a quote in me. I had questions to ask. And any of you that know me know I probably asked one too many. But nevertheless, I've had already paid thirty six hundred dollars. I got, I need some answers, my friend. Right? It's fair, right? But I can see it in his face. So I respected his time. He was busy, but he was so kind, trying so hard. I'm just trying to make a point to you. Imagine the facial expressions of people. Imagine your own life. Imagine the things that you go through. The reason I want to tell you that is because the love of the Lord is in your heart and life. It ain't just about you no more, my friend. It's about the other people around you. Because they're hurting. And if they don't get to hear the good news of Jesus, they may stay the way that they are for the rest of their life. Amen? Now, just think about this little girl. I don't know. This is just how I see it. How many times did she see Naaman walk in after a hard day in battle? And then maybe she even saw, maybe he forgot to close the door completely and she wasn't trying to look, but maybe she could see through the crack of him trying to peel and close off that leaky skin and the facial expression and the weight and the burden. How many times did she see that? I don't know if she ever did. I'm just trying to tell you. Something in her said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria that he would cure him. See, if you're so bound up in your own thing, my friend, you'll never be able to see the people right, around you. Right, you'll never be right. able to see the hurt. That's not God's will for your life. God's will for your life is that you would be connected to the house of God so that you could be to the right house of God. I'm not trying to say you're the only one. I'm just trying to make a point. Where you can hear the right word of God, where the Holy Spirit can minister to your heart, minister to your life, so that He can set you free. So that he can grow you up. Is it going to happen overnight? Not absolutely not. But if you never get to a place where you can grow and stay there, you're never going to grow. And if you never grow, you're just going to constantly keep going through the same old cycle. Like someone used to say, take another lap. But he was talking about the children of Israel. 40 years wandering around. And me and Sean would say, dude, why would you struggle at the same time? He would say, take another lap. You're not ready yet. You got to go through that same old trial one more time, my friend. <laughs> Look, I can go preach on that. We're not going to do it. <laughs> I want you to see this. This young lady. Now, with all that said, I want you to see these things stick out in my heart with this girl. She's an Old Testament little girl, 850 so years before Jesus, and I see all these two New Testament truths in this little girl's life. She's an evangelist. Yeah. Come on now, she's over here preaching. That. Oh, I would that my master would see the prophet of Israel. He would be healed of his leprosy. But look, she's in the midst of a trial, my friend. Right. Even in the midst of her trial, she is still talking about the God and the prophet of Israel. Amen. You're going through trials. I'm going through trials. Lord, I, listen, don't think you're the one that's the worst off, my friend. Right, right. Don't think you're the one. You might have it bad. I'm not trying to take away from what you're going through. But they got somebody probably sitting on the side of you or behind you that's got their own thing that they're going through. And it what you know Lord wants to do? He wants to heal us. He wants to heal us. And he wants to build us up. And he wants to grow us up so that he can use us. So that whatever trial you went through, he can heal you. And then I guarantee you, he's going to put you in the presence of another person with that same type of trial so that you can minister to them. Listen, she has some kind of joy of the Lord in her heart. Even in the midst of her trial, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen? She's got peace. In her life, the world is never going to stop being full of chaos until the Prince of Peace returns to this earth, my friend. You can pray for the peace of Jerusalem all day long, but you're not in the Lord said pray for the peace of Jerusalem, but we had taken it out of context. There will be no peace in Jerusalem until, until the Prince of Peace returns. This, we ain't going to fix this, but we will abide and we will continue to live and we will continue to proclaim this glorious gospel until the Lord's foot hits the Mount of Olives and splits out of that in his return and he takes his rule and reign as king and lord of lords upon this earth. Yes, yes, Hallelujah. <laughs> the joy of the Lord. And listen, in the midst of your trials, the Lord will give you peace. 
He's the Prince of Peace. Yes, sir. He's not just going to be the Prince of Peace in Jerusalem, my friend. He's going to be the Prince of Peace on your heart right now, today, if you will let him. Yes, sir. He ain't going to make you let him. He's not going to make you surrender to him. He gave you a free will. Dude, this is so beautiful and so deep. And I wish we had time to talk about it. But look, he gave you a free will. <laughs> He wants you to love Him. He wants you to trust Him. He wants you to surrender to Him. He will not demand it from you. Oh, He will create circumstances and situations. He will put you in the midst of trials. And He will give you every opportunity to finally come to the place like, I used to say this a lot, like Roberto Duran when he fought Sugar Ray Leonard. No mouth, Lord! No mouth! I give it to you, Lord, because I can't carry this weight no more. I surrender. What does it take to take to cause you to surrender? Yeah. What does it take to cause me to surrender? And you know, I'm okay, okay, so preacher, you surrendered to the internet pornography. You surrender to the quart of beer. But what about your tongue sometimes when you respond to tongue? And it, look, you just surrender to one thing, guess what? Tomorrow when you wake up, you got a new day to surrender to. You think you're being conformed, molded into the image of Right. Who's doing the work? The Holy Spirit. That's right. We don't even have time to get into this this morning, but it's so important you can't skip it. Come How on. does the Holy Spirit flow? Through the finished work of Jesus. Oh, through the cross. Not the physical object of wood. Through what Jesus accomplished spiritually. When he died on Calvary's tree. When he paid the sin debt. And you said, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And now you've been clothed in righteousness. And now as you continue to trust in what Christ has done, the Holy Spirit flows like the yes, cleansing yes. waters that change man's body. Yes. And it changes you. Yes. And it gives you hope. Yes. And it allows you to be born again. Listen. With all this stuff being said, she's sharing the truth. Is she not? Hey, look, is this not how it starts? <laughs> is this not how it starts? Like what I'm trying to say is in your life today, when you get saved and the Holy Spirit starts moving in your life and you go through trials and tribulations, but you learn how to continue to trust God and he grows you up and he puts peace in your heart, even though there's times that are bad and joy of the Lord is in your heart. But isn't that how it starts that you Desire to start to share the truth, and then when you share the truth, that leper gets to hear the truth, and a seed of hope gets planted in his heart. I'm here to tell you right now, that's the word of the Lord. That's how God works in people's hearts and lives, and he's just trying to get us all there. All right, let's shift gears and let's talk about me. So he went down and he dipped himself seven times. Isn't that number seven something? Don't you see that throughout the scripture? Amen. I, I love numbers too, symbology and all these things. You know, man was created on the sixth day, where there's a whole lot of things with number six. We won't get into that right now. But God rested on the seventh day. The number seven is a, is a number of fulfillment, completion. Everything God does is a seven. <laughs> you know, when God does it. See, when I do it, it's a six. <laughs> it's, even if I do it my best, it's lacking more. You understand what I'm saying? I can only go so far. The Lord wants me to work with Him. That's a whole other message. Koinonia, translated as communion or fellowship. God wants me to joint participate with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's where you advance Bible students. God wants you to, to participate with Him in the journey of Christianity. But you can't do it in your own strength. Part of your participation is your surrender to God's will. And then he does his part. That's, I can't, don't get no better than that. But that's what the number seven means. When God does it, it's fulfilled. It's complete. Amen. So he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. I want you to see these three words right here. We're going to start off with this word born again. I want to talk to you about being born again. Because in this story that I see with Naaman, I see both baptism, but I also see really being born again. I don't want you to get confused. I don't want you to think that they're exactly one and the same because they're not. But people that are born again get baptized. Amen? Some denominations believe that you're not really born again until you get baptized. I don't believe that. That's not true. But people that are born again are supposed to be baptized. 
Yeah. Okay, now let me talk to you a little bit about being born again. What does that even mean, preacher? What does it mean to be born again? All right, well, let me explain to you the best way I know. Real quick. <laughs> Jesus was performing miracles and people were sick. Can you imagine if, if you walked into Walmart and the Lord told you to start laying hands on somebody that's sick, somebody in a wheelchair, people started getting up, people started getting healed. You know how fast the Lord was wow. spreading, my friend? Walmart parking lot be slapped full. And then the Lord said, go back over there and start laying hands on them again. And you think the top of the town wouldn't be around? Right? And that's basically Jesus was healing people. And, and so when Nicodemus was a religious leader. He didn't tell his religious friends what he was going to do. The Bible says he went at night. Mm. He said, Rabbi, which means great teacher. Rabbi, Rabbi, look at these things you do. You know what Jesus doesn't even acknowledge that? He said, very, very, truly, truly, unless a man is born again, yeah. he cannot see the kingdom of God, and he will not enter the kingdom of God. Now, I don't mean to preach that whole thing right now, but Nicodemus says, how can a man climb a second time into his mother's womb? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, what's flesh is flesh. What's spirit yes. is spirit. Mm -hmm. So what Jesus was talking about is a birth spiritual. Yes, sir. So what does it mean to be born again? I didn't even know that for 12 years as a Christian until the Lord got a hold of me. I was preaching one time in Franklin, and all of a sudden I'm talking about born again, and it hit me. Oh my gosh, I get it now. Now, most of y'all are smarter than me and you already realize it. But I was born the first time like Adam. So when I was born from my mama, hey mama, I love you back there. When I was born from my mother, I was born. See, what you like or not, your real daddy's name was Adam. I know, my daddy's name was Jim. But when I got my, this bad DNA was from Adam. Right, right. Adam in the fall as the father of humanity has produced an offspring of Adam's race that are fallen and have a sinful nature. But God in his grace and his mercy sent the second Adam, the one without sin, to come upon this earth to die on the cross. And now when this gospel message about being born again is told and you say, yes, Lord, and you receive. Jesus Christ into your heart. How do I receive Jesus Christ, preacher? Do come to the ring. You don't have to do it at this altar, my friend. It's a good place to do it. Yeah, but you don't have to do it at this altar. You can do it in a car somewhere, under a tree somewhere, in a closet somewhere, in your bed at night. But what you gotta do is you gotta be real with God and you gotta say, Lord, I'm a sinner! Lord. But I believe you sent Jesus for my sin. Come into my heart, Lord. Forgive me of my sin. You don't even have to do all that, really. To be honest with you, I heard that. And I'll tell you all that story before about that heroin junkie, Steve Hill. And he was over there. Uh, he had no more heroin left. And he would have no food. And, and, he, and he had a bunch of empty syringes. And he had been listening to the preachers in the street preach time and time again about Jesus. And they're like, all right, who's getting saved tonight so we can get some free food? And he ain't got nothing left. And he sits there and he takes those empty syringes and he slings them into the ceiling. And then all of a sudden, he says, Jesus. Jesus. And he just started crying on the name of Jesus. And, and, and all of a sudden, it happened. He got saved. He got born again. Hallelujah. If you get saved, you probably won't wake up tomorrow acting like me, so I'll freak out. Okay. <laughs> it takes time to get like this. Okay. Whether it's good or bad, it takes time to get like this. But listen, it'll start. And it's a good place to start, my friend. When the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. Oh, it's a good, good start. Yeah. That's what it means to be born again. All right, now, see, baptism is an outward representation of what's already happened on the inside. Yeah. Praise God, we got, you know, sister getting baptized today. I mean, my brother too. But he already understands some of this. But look, I thank God that the Lord brought you over here, sister. And look, I know when you got saved, it was legit. Mm -hmm. Dustin Miller was preaching, amen. Yeah. The presence of God was sticking this way. Don't worry, I'm going to get Dustin back. He shakes stuff up, but that's all right. We need to be shaken. And, and, and she says, sister, say, I ain't never felt nothing like that before. When the Holy Spirit, so the Holy Spirit, Chief, Chief, you're, you're a new creation. We become, the Bible says we become new creations yes. in Christ Jesus. Yes. The old man born of Adam has passed away. Behold, all things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Ephesians chapter 4 talks about the new man. Hallelujah. The new man is born again in Christ. And guess what? Now you're just beginning your journey. See, what, what a baptism is really supposed to be is what the church reduced the whole raise your hand thing to. I mean, I'm not trying to pick on the church. I'm just trying to tell you. I might even ask you to raise your hand at the end of the service. But let us understand, the true public declaration of the faith is water baptism. Mm, yeah. Okay, it's not that you raise your hand one time in service. It's not even like when I was 19 with my long hair sitting in the back of that church, ran up to the altar and fell to my knees and gave my heart to Jesus. That was public. Yeah. But really, my true public declaration was until they brought me out to Lake Lord and ducked me in them in the dirty waters of Lake Lord. Isn't that interesting? Kind of like the dirty waters of Jordan that made me mm -hmm. like. Nevertheless, it's an outward representation. What are you talking about? See, the old man is you standing up in the water or sitting down, and then the old man dying is you going under the water and being buried, mm -hmm. and the new man coming up is the new you resurrected mm -hmm. Jesus. So water baptism is an external symbol. It's a beautiful thing. No one told us to be water baptized. They ain't going to get away from that. We're supposed to be water baptized. Amen. We got room for you. Amen. <laughs> if you need to be water baptized. But anyway, born again, baptism made clean. Look, that brother came up. See, this is bigger than just water baptism right here. This brother got saved in the Old Testament version of it. He, he was healed. His skin became like new, like a child. He was born again. Let me keep moving. Moves me now. What name is said? If not, please let your servant at least be given two mules, load of earth, or dirt. For your servant will no longer offer burnt offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Look at that. He had a life change, did he not? He had a life change, and now what's the word conviction here? I don't know if I can do this or not, but I'm going to try. I was thinking about that word convi conviction. You can't see it. Let me just read it to you. Conviction does, it has a lot of meanings. This is just an American dictionary. The act of convicting someone, as in the court of law, or the state of being convicted, or the act of convincing a person, or the state of being convinced. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that the word conviction has multiple meanings to it. And sometimes, I think this is important for me to try to say this. Have you ever, just give me your time just for a little bit. I know I've been going kind of long. But have you ever felt after you've been saved and you've come to church, weighed down and burdened? And even sometimes maybe when you come in here and I start talking about sin, I'm like, oh man, this is a compliment. Have you ever felt that way? I want you to know there's a difference between the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the condemnation of the yes. enemy. You need to understand that. That's good. Listen to That's me. Good. The Holy Spirit will convict you, and he will convict me of what is sin. Yeah. He's not okay with it. Okay. We can sit here and play tiddly wings with the, with the gospel all day long. I got to tell you, I need a lying prophet if I tell you that God will convict him of sin because he doesn't need to do that. Okay. But what I am here to tell you, though, is this. Is that God loves you. Yeah. And his conviction is a way of him chastising and revealing to you the things that are in your life that he wants you to ask him to remove. Yeah. He wants to help you. He's not asking you to pull. My old dad used to say, boy, you better pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Okay. Before I put a knot on your head. <laughs> well, guess what, daddy? <laughs> in this walk, Ain't no man pulling his own self up by the bootstraps. That's right. That's right. You better learn how to ask the Lord, Lord, please put my boots on for me. Lord, please. Now, if you will learn to walk with the Lord like that, you will you will mount up with the wings of eagles and you will soar. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Because it's the Lord doing the work. It's the Lord giving you strength. It's the Lord giving you power. But look, the difference between condemnation and conviction is that conviction is that the Lord's trying to reason with you. He's trying to convince you that his way is the right way and that your way is the wrong way. And that's why the word of God is so important because if we don't understand the word, we just take what everybody else has told us the word says. Don't camouflage the Hebrew text. You don't need to be protected from your body, right? That's what the writer said in that book. We need to know what the word of God says the way God wrote it. We don't need it filtered out and parsed out to us. No, we need to get into it and let God speak. Amen? 
And when we do, he will change our life just like he changed Naaman's. Mm -hmm. And he will begin to convict us of things. That, listen, don't get mad at me if I come in here. Some people say, well, that's just a preacher's opinion. Okay, and what I'm saying that. And you musicians, I'm not picking on you. I'm just using it. This is part of my life, dude. I'll talk about it as much as I want to. Okay? I'm not trying to offend nobody. If you don't agree with me, that's fine. We can, at the end service, if you like hugs, I'm going to hug you. I'll kiss you on the cheek. If you don't like all that, I'll fist bump you. If you don't like all that, I'll wink at you. It's okay. I love you. I hope you still love me. But I ain't going to shrink back from telling you what I have learned in the faith. You know, and, and, and sometimes we compromise with music. Yeah. Dude, why do I always get myself into this? I'm just going to be real with you, man. Is it the Holy Spirit that's driving the music, or is it another spirit? Amen. Was Satan created with musical instruments in his body according to the Word of God, or not? Do we still like sometimes the way that some of those songs make us feel? Yep. Because it appeals to our flesh. Okay? And what I'm trying to say is, is that is the Holy Spirit trying to convict us in those areas? But sometimes, wherever that conviction is, He's trying to bring us correction. But our flesh, and not your flesh, my flesh. Whether it's music or something else. Whether it's me having to get the last word or whatever. The Lord's convicting me and he's trying to convince me that there's something that's not right and it's holding me back. But then my flesh says, I do what I want to do. And you know, really and truly, if we were having a conversation with the Lord, we would be saying, you gave me a free will. And I'll make my own choices. Good luck with that, my friend. I learned it left in this walk that that don't work too good. Right, right. I've still got a long way to go. <laughs> Trust me. But I'm just trying to say... That's something that I've come to a realization. Yes. Music will jack you up. Yeah. Sure. Don't tell me you're wrong. Don't, don't think I don't know that. <laughs> I had the fruit. I had rappers delight when I was a kid. I had Michael Jackson. I was going, oh, baby, I had Van Halen. I haven't been to Van Halen concerts, ZZ Top, Nazareth, Hair of the Dog. Dude, I have been through it. I done, look, don't tell me. I just saw some dude get get jabbed with a switchblade at the top level of the summit in Houston, Texas. And at 15, he was bleeding into the water fountain because the Mexican was... I love Mexican. Uh, because the Hispanic dude wanted to give me your concert t-shirt, man. He said, no, dude, you can't have my concert. Ah! He was in there bleeding. I didn't see the dude. Don't tell me. I know what I'm talking about. The secular music world will corrupt you. It will destroy you. It's singing about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And now it's singing hip hop. Yeah. Treat that woman like a piece of meat. Put a bullet in the, in the top of man's teeth. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. Dude. What are they saying? They're singing the world. They're singing flesh. They're singing the spirit of Antichrist. And we're over there. Feed me. Feed me. Give me more. Yeah. Yeah! Right, right, I know I'm on the road. <laughs> Conviction from the Holy Spirit will change you. Come on. Amen. Come on. It's not to put it in your heart. It's not to show you right from wrong. Yeah. You know? That's right. Lord called me to be really wrong, my friend. <laughs> Look, here you go. And this is how I'm coming. Romans 7, 4, you should be married to another. That's good. See, when your life is changed, you get convicted. You get married to another. Who you get married to? Jesus. By the way, thank you. Yes, it was Jeffrey Bowles. <laughs> Got married to Angela, but you better be married to Jesus. Amen. She better be married to Jesus. You be better be married to Jesus. I better be married to Jesus. That's who you got married to when you got saved. That you would be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That's good. Now, real quick, I'm going to close this message for you. Here's this girl caught up in captivity, caught up in the trials of life. Oh, would that my master would see the prophet. He would be cured of his leprosy. Naaman goes and what happens? He gets, he's changed, he gets healed, he gets made whole and on his way out of town. Would you just give me two loaves of dirt? Because from now on, when I go into that temple, I will never give another sacrifice to women again. I will only sacrifice to the Lord your God. Hallelujah. Give me that dirt so I can make myself an altar. Some dirt from Israel. Some, some land. Give me some geography. Give me some geography from the land of God that I put it on the inside of there. And when I bow down and he bows down wherever he is, I'm going to get on my knees, 
on this Israeli dirt right here, and I'm going to lift my hands to the God of Israel because He is the only true God. He is the one that healed me. He is the one that saved me. Hallelujah. I don't know about you this morning, but Lord, give me some of that dirt, amen, so that I can walk in your ways. Singers, musicians, let's close this out with a song of worship, amen.